two of the questions I ask in my one-on-ones are, what's your favorite thing about our board meetings? And what, you know, i.e. what's working well? And then what isn't working for you? What do you not like? I'm Rich Frazier. And I'm Russ Fanoff. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. We believe strong nonprofits can change the world. And our goal with each episode is to bring you insightful conversations with thought leaders from the nonprofit sector. Let's dive in. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. I'm Rich Frazier, and today we're continuing our conversation from last episode on nonprofit boards. This time, we're focusing on how to have more productive board meetings. It's not uncommon for board meetings to run long, or oftentimes we talk about the wrong things in our board meetings, or we're not thinking strategically. So today we're going to have a little bit of conversation about that. And again, we're going to be talking with our friends from the organization One in Ten here in Phoenix, Nate Roten and Rick McCartney. Could you please remind our listeners about your experience serving on and working with nonprofit boards, specifically One in Ten? Thank you, Rich. Uh, I'm Nate Roten, the CEO of One in Ten. I've been with the organization for seven and a half years. I come from a background in the for-profit space but have served on various boards and commissions throughout the years. So I find it to be an incredible fortune that I'm doing this work and I also work with an incredible board. That's awesome. Thanks, Nate. Rick, how about you? What's your role with One in 10? I am board chair of One in 10. I have been involved with boards for the past 25 years. All have been relative to youth, um, in our case, LGBTQ youth at risk. And I just have been honored to be a part of the community in this way. One in 10 uh, is such an important organization, and we've watched it over the last seven years that I've been on the board, um, just climb year over year into an amazing organization with its ups and downs. So it's been an incredible experience. Thanks, Rick and Nate. Before we dig into specific advice for making board meetings more productive, let's get a sense of the stakes here. In your experience with the boards that you have served on in the past, how important is this? And what impact can it have on the nonprofit's work and mission? I would say that it's extremely important. It's probably one of the most important things if you're in a leadership position on a board that you should be focused on is what are these board meetings like? Are they going to be productive first and foremost for the executive director or the CEO, for the organization itself? The board meeting is not for and about the board. It's for and about the organization. So for that to be productive, really is critical. I mean, it's detrimental when it is not. I've been, I've had experience where we've lost an amazing board member on one of the boards that I'm on because the board meetings were really just downloads. It was stuff that at the end of the day, I remember that person saying to me, I could just read all that information that we were doing for two hours in a board meeting. And it really helped me realize how critical it is to come prepared And that a board meeting is where not just your expectation is that these board members are going to be engaged, but that you are doing these things that can help engage a board member. Nate, do you have anything to add to that? I I don't really. I've never heard you say that in my entire life. (laughs) I know. I was just, all of my talking points would just rehash what he just said. So I think we're good. (laughs) That's okay. We can roll into the next question because it's relevant. (laughs) Okay. We we don't want to waste people's time. We want to make sure that we're, we're talking about relevant issues. So that means that preparation is key. So let's talk about how you each prepare for the work that you do in these board meetings. Um, How do you make sure that you and the whole board are adequately prepared for the meeting? Nate, I'm going to start with you as the executive director. Thanks, Rich. The, The big first step is the agenda. And you have to make sure that that agenda is well thought out, that the proper work has gone into creating it so that you're also not forgetting things that are really critically uh, important to that meeting. So for instance, if there's a certain vote that needs to happen, if there's a discussion that needs to happen, it has to be on that agenda. Um, I have made the mistake in the past of thinking, oh, well, I'll remember to do that, but then I don't, and we don't end up discussing it or or vetting it or voting on it in that meeting. And um, then that 
you know, causes a significant delay depending on your board meeting uh, cadence. But um, that agenda also needs to have opportunity to be informed by multiple people. So it's not just the CEO and the board chair. It's it's every member of the board should feel free to submit items that they think are, are, are critically important or at least suggest, um, as well as the senior leadership team of the organization. If there's things that are coming up that are important, um, they should feel safe to do so, whether that's through the channel of the CEO or through the board chair, they need to be able to come to someone with those concerns um, or suggestions. And I, I think having all of that buy-in in the agenda just creates a more comprehensive and well thought out agenda that then everybody can get behind. I think also in preparation, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when we were on your amazing podcast just a few weeks ago that, you know, our executive committee has a monthly meeting two weeks before the board meeting to discuss any of those issues, all of that information um, that we maybe have been discussing back and forth or maybe through meetings we've had with the organization, we bring together so that we've got a good sense of what we all want to talk about. We're all reminded, of course, that executive committee meeting includes the leader of the organization where we can really plan and put together, as Nate said, an amazing agenda that matters that really will have an effect on the organization, not just download a bunch of information. But the other piece is being sure, as usually is the leader or leadership of a board, that everyone is held accountable to be prepared coming to the meeting. So board members, I mean, nothing could possibly feel worse than being the CEO or the executive director of an organization, work full time all the time doing all this stuff, and then have all the weight of a board that comes to the or to the meeting on a, on a monthly basis or, you know, twice every two months, whatever the occasion is, and not have the board be prepared. I mean, that is a huge load for the staff and the people that are running the organization. So it is critical. The obligation of these board members is to do the job. I remember being in a meeting with um, a bunch of board members on another board that I'm on. It was a retreat and we were discussing, someone brought up, you know, I would love to have a communication on a regular basis that would have all this information. And maybe each of us as board members could talk to various staff members. And I remember halting that immediately saying that is the worst thing that we can do. This is not about us building a second job for our one employee we have as the executive director or CEO of the organization. This is about our doing us doing our part as volunteers to be engaged and understand what it means to know what our programming is, to be involved when there's a volunteer opportunity, um, to read the budget when the budget is sent. With one in 10, we send it a full week prior and there have been times when we haven't done that because this or that hasn't happened. And that that's a burden on our board members when we're saying, look, you are meant to be accountable to read all this information, know it so that you can come to the board meeting. And instead of us downloading an entire budget, we're going to go over it. I think right now, Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like five minutes that we discuss budget because the expectation is everybody has read it. And if anyone has questions after that five minutes, throw out your question, we'll solve that problem, and then we'll vote to approve that budget. And it's not just about budget. To your point, Rick, it's also the, the monthly financials. So all right. of that is in the consent agenda and really doesn't take up much time in the board meeting. So it's not a, you know an elaborate presentation by the treasurer or myself around something that everybody should have reviewed in the consent agenda. Now, this may change if there were significant financial issues in the organization, but that's something that, I, that really should be held for the minutia in the finance committee. And I think that goes for all committees and their related work. My belief is, and, and I have expressed this to a lot of organizations that, that I've worked with, is that the finances are what the finances are. You're not going to change them. So there's no point in spending a lot of time talking about them. <laughs> but let's talk about communicating the expectations to the board members. What's the best way for you to do that? How do you make sure the board members do their homework before they show up to the meeting? I just put a different password on every document. And if they don't ask me for it, I know they haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way. Now, someone actually told me that they used to do that. And they were yeah. shocked by how few people actually asked for the password. So I think about that frequently. I don't do that, but there are, some, <laughs> there are sometimes questions in the meetings that come up that it's like, I know you didn't read my report. So, <laughs> you know, you, you try to, um, what I've done, particularly in the last few months as we've come back to in-person board meetings, is ensure that I have questions prepared that reference back to my written report, because I'm not 
rehashing my written report in my uh, part of the board meeting, but asking questions that then open up for conversation or input from the board that, that they would have need to ideally read what I prepared for them so that they could come to the meeting to be ready to, to contribute or discuss. That's not a foolproof way. Uh, I, I'm sure there are people that are reviewing the documents, you know, as we're sitting in the meeting, but that's just one suggestion. Mm -hmm. Rick, how about you? Yeah, I would just say, you know, I, I, I bring it up frequently because I do read all of it because I really want to be informed. And it's amazing how much better the meeting is when you do. So we say stuff like that in the meetings. We remind them. Um, we send out a couple of reminders beforehand. I always say to staff and to the executive director or the CEO, at the end of the day, if you really want a strong, effective board, then you have to nudge them to do what you want them to do. They're all volunteers. They all have other jobs. They all may have a crisis that we don't know about. In our case, it's 18 other board members. I mean, if we really want to be effective, then we need to lead them. And so the reminders are fantastic. Sending it out a week or so before so that they've got time to read and then reminding them of the expectation. And then as Nate said so brilliantly, we just test the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned the consent agenda. What goes in the consent agenda? What doesn't go in the consent agenda? What are the pros and cons? I think the big piece that we've already referenced is the financials. Uh, I think some organizations, and, and this goes for us back in the day, we would spend an inordinate portion of the board meeting time going over financials. And you instantly see people's eyes glaze over if they're interested in that, they're going to be on the finance committee. They just want to know about issues, if there are any. And so a, a proper dashboard of reporting needs to be included. But the financials absolutely should be in that consent agenda, as should all of the reports from senior leadership. So in our case, that's five different reports that get included in there um, that inform the board on the status of, of different programs, um, priorities that I'm working on as the CEO, uh, all of that should be in there. And then it's, if a board member wants to discuss that, they can ask for something to be pulled out of the consent agenda prior to it passing. But otherwise, it's just arming them with information so that we can have a generative conversation about certain points in the meeting. But otherwise, those things are all done and satisfied as far as the governance piece is concerned with a, a vote for approval, and we move on. And then that doesn't take up the, the precious time and important meeting. And the formality of it. We really do try to function in a very formal way when we do our meetings. A vote isn't just a yay, nay, or abstention. I mean, they really need to know what they're voting for. I mean, the reason we're voting for anything is to give permission to the people that um, are paid through the donations of the great citizens of our community. I mean, we have an obligation. And I mean, we really do take that very seriously. And so we run a formal meeting so that we can get through these things. We always want to make it fun. Um, you know, I know we talk about engagement and, you know, so food and fun definitely helps, especially now that we're in person. So let's let's get into the weeds a little bit on actually being in the boardroom and running that productive meeting, Rick. So this is one I, where I really want to get into your personal experience. And, and what are the tricks that you rely on? What what have you seen that works really well? Well, as we said, I think being, being sure that they're informed. I mean, you really do have to make sure that they are connected to what that agenda is about. But the biggest thing is, and Nate and I talk about it all the time, because as we're um, building agendas or as we're discussing various issues and things that are going on and we want the board to be involved in whether it's a presentation by Nate of a new service or a new plan for us, anything along those lines, you know, we want their feedback on it. We don't want to just prescribe or describe everything that's going on. We want to be able to open it up to discussion. Mm -hmm. um, that is the greatest way to have engagement is to ask of each of the individuals to come to the table with their thinking and with their mind. You know, some board members just don't engage that way, we've noticed. And so, you know, I, as the chair of these meetings, will often point to that individual and say, do you have anything to say? And it's funny how many times they actually do, they just don't chime in. So I think managing those discussions is really critical to getting everybody engaged. And then the leadership of that board should very much be focused on what it's going to take to engage the individual members that they have as part of their board. 
I think that is part of the leadership's role is to be a bit of a cheerleader in making sure that things are rising to the top. We had a board meeting a number of years ago with one in ten, uh, a number of months ago with one in 10 where it was just an opportunity for board members using sticky notes, which I'm usually against, but this was a really great way to do it and talk about the issues, you know, what's concerning to you. And then everyone had 15 minutes to write down everything they wanted to write down short and succinct. You could spend the whole 15 minutes on one note, both sides didn't matter. And then we put them up on a board and sorted them into a couple of different columns so that we could get a really good sense of the feedback of this board. What were the successes? What were the concerns? Uh, what do you think priorities look like to you? It was amazing how much consensus there was mm -hmm. within that room and how cohesive that thinking was. I've seen that a lot. It usually is. But it, it's just those kinds of tactics, I think, really help people feel engaged, useful. But as I've said to Nate before, we have to really be sure we need what it is we're doing. You know, let's not just come up with something so that we can have a, a, an enjoyable time for two hours. Right. It's work. Um, and it has to mean something to the organization or forget about it. Or in, on occasion, it can mean something to just the board. It might be a social side of, of some piece of it to keep people engaged. All really good. But at the end of the day, it's about the organization benefiting. Nate, what's your input? You know, just to build on that in a little, slightly different direction is around fundraising, because this is a, an area that every board, no matter what the organization is, is charged with some element of fundraising or some amount of fundraising. And it's also one that I find a lot of people are really scared of. <laughs> or their immediate response is, I'm just not a fundraiser. I don't know how to ask for money. Yeah, I have found in my experience, it's the most exciting part of being on a board. And it's something that you're really inviting people to be a part of, of the mission. And so along that line, I think an annual training with the board, and this is something we have done in the past at one in 10, but we're not always great about doing it every single year. I think we should, and it's giving myself a reminder of that, mm -hmm. um, to do a, a, a workshop around fundraising so that it's like the 101, people can, can role play, they can make a list of who are, you know, 20 people in your network that you have not had a conversation about one in 10 with or whatever organization that you're on the board for. And um, let's make a list now. You're not going to call them on the spot, but then we can talk through what would a plan look like to reach out to some of these folks. And at the end of the day, making sure that they know, the board knows what staff is here to do in supporting them in doing that fundraising. Is it that they're just going to connect the CEO with this person in their network and maybe go to coffee, the three of them, or arrange for a tour of the facilities or what have you. There's so many different elements there. And then at one in 10, we have three significant events throughout the year. And uh, that's an opportunity for board members to bring those folks to those events and uh, really ensure that they're hearing about the programs, but following up with them after and saying, you know, what did you like about what you heard? And is this something that that we can count on you to support or that, that I can have further conversations with you about? It can be a much more organic thing than most people, I, I think, immediately think of in terms of you're not going to your granny and saying, hand over 10 grand. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, you know? <laughs> If Granny's got bank, let's just be honest, right? <laughs> right, bring her in. Maybe she should be on the board. No, just kidding. Exactly. <laughs> Hi, this is Curtis Schmidt, producer of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. If you're a nonprofit professional who has questions about your program, or maybe you feel like you've taken your advocacy, fundraising, or membership effort as far as you can and you need some fresh ideas, then we have a special offer for you today. NPFX podcast listeners can get a free 30-minute consultation with IPM Advancement, no strings attached, when you go to ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Just enter a few details and an IPM team member will contact you to follow up. It's that easy. That website again is ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Thanks for listening and we hope to talk to you soon. Now let's return to the episode. Well, it's been my experience that, that most board members would rather chew glass than fundraise, but you know, once they learned that 
fundraising is a spectrum and that asking for money is just a dot on that spectrum. There's a lot of other jobs you could be involved in, right? There's a lot of other things that don't involve asking people for money. Well, as part of our commitment letter, which we spoke about in the podcast that we did with you a couple of weeks ago, one of the things is give get an amount of money. And we've had some, you know, conversations about what does that mean to you know, it's a give get because it doesn't have to be your money. We want you to help work to raise and bring awareness to the organization. And that'll be calculated as part of that. But the reality is, is the one thing everybody has in common on the board is passion for the organization. So I always say, just speak to your passion when you're talking to somebody. And that is fundraising enough in a lot of cases. Yeah. And then don't forget to get their phone number and email and give it to Nate or to somebody else on the board that wants to tackle them. And, you know, I like to to speak about changing the paradigm, right? So we're not asking anybody to do anything that's painful. We're giving them an opportunity to feel as good as we do when we give to our favorite organizations. So Rick, you mentioned your sticky note exercise a little while ago. So there, there's another tool that I, that I have, and that is just to get immediate feedback on what's working and what's not working at, at a board meeting. And that's just to do a quick little survey at the end of the meeting. And that's just to sort of hand out a piece of paper to each board member. And it's three simple questions. And those are, did we talk about the right things? Was I heard? And was this a good use of my time? And that goes back to the board chair. And that gives you immediate feedback and an opportunity for real-time course correction for next board meeting. That's great. What about allowing time for those generative conversations? Nate, you, you touched on that. How often does that happen? How often do you give yourselves time to, to sort of step outside Robert's rules of order and talk, have those larger conversations to talk about vision casting or problem framing or if this, then what? I'm going to be really honest with you, Rich, especially for those other CEOs and EDs that might be listening out there. The answer is not enough. We really, we talk about this and we've tried to design things in the agenda to help to foster more generative conversation, but it's difficult. I think a lot of people focus on, you know, let's get the order of business done and then they have other things they need to do. So that's where it's really critical to have the proper planning for your annual retreat. It's where it's critical to have the one-on-ones with the ED CEO. Two of the questions I ask in my one-on-ones are, What's what? What's your favorite thing about our board meetings? And you know, i.e., what's working well, and then what isn't working for you? What do you not like? And really ensure that we're delivering on what each board member is looking for to the best of our ability. But on on, on my end, so that on the CEO's end, it's really it's looking at your report. It's looking at I keep a list of things throughout the month or two months, depending on the cadence of the meeting, that I want to make sure and report on and then I come up with questions that I truly want input on. I'm just not throwing questions out there for the sake of discussion. I really want their input. And I may even send those premature or earlier to specific board members that I really need their input on something so that they come to the meeting prepared for that and or can send that to me earlier if, if if time is of the essence. But I think that's going to be key. But I think we're still figuring that out. Mm -hmm. And and I think a lot of boards are from what I hear from from other CEOs and board chairs. Um, So it's tricky. It's not an easy, perfect science. Yeah, it's it's tough to find time to take away from the daily operation of the organization. Yes. But I love something that Nate pointed out, and that is, you know, keeping a list during those times when we're not meeting um, and then prepping so that they can think about it, come to the meeting and actually get some really strong, that is a fantastic way to engage board members. I mean, at the end of the day, when we're onboarding board members, at least in my experience, we've always talked about, hey, you know, an engaged board member is somebody that comes in and can use that great, brilliant mind they have and that experience they have to grow the organization. And that's rubber meeting the road when we have those open off the Uh, not off the agenda, but off the formality, you know, remove the formality and have a very vulnerable, honest conversation and ask those questions from the CEO or the other way around. Ask, you know, have board members ask of the CEO or even staff. We've invited uh, staff members to come in and present on various pieces of the organization. I remember being in an organization with uh, the Children's Museum of Phoenix, being on that board and one of the beginnings of the board meetings was the woman who ran the gift shop came in and explained how we run the gift shop. 
And it was so informative that there was so much work and understanding and customer service and things that I don't think any of us as board members had ever really thought about. So we do that with programming. We do that with various things. But to Nate's point, we should be doing it more. Yeah, yeah. Rick, this next question is for you. And we're getting close to the end of the podcast, but I do want to put this out there. Board president to board president, because those of us who are in charge of running these meetings, we always run up against this, is balancing the need to give every agenda item its due and every board member their voice against making sure that we run on time and don't keep members and, and staff members past time. How do we do that? How do we, how do we do that without putting limits on feedback and discussion? Yeah, and it's it's not an easy thing to do. We have two hour board meetings and we're meeting um, every two months instead of, well, actually we've chosen the various months based on events and different big items that we know we're gonna need to discuss. So it's not just every two months. Sometimes it can be month to month, um, but we have six meetings per year and keeping that agenda together is hard. Lately, what we've been doing is we've been under um, setting our time so that we're not quite making two hours so that we've got a little extra time um, that's worked. The last board meeting that we had, however, we did that and it, it worked fairly well, but then we got into a discussion and it engaged us well over our two hours. Mm -hmm. But as a board chair, I will say it's my job to look at the clock and it's my job to say, hey, anybody that wants to bow out, we're going to run over. Do you all feel like we should be running over or should we you know, move on and table this for another meeting? And you really have to be conscious. That's what they want. That's what your board members want. That's what any of the guests of the board meeting or certainly the leader of the organization wants is to know that you're conscious of their time. Yeah. And I love that question, by the way. Yeah. And I'm one to cut in as a discussion gets further saying, you know, let's make this the last answer because we have to move on or just in the interest of time. Is there any does anybody else have anything to say very quickly? We don't need to double up on this. Yeah, there is a, a, a leadership style that I think is important that can help move them along. And that does engage people to feel like their time is not going to be wasted. Yeah. Nate. I think something to add to that uh, from my perspective as the CEO is that the board um, I believe it was Rick's idea quite some time ago, added an executive session on every single agenda. Whereas previously we would only have it when it was needed, but it it kind of made me feel uncomfortable if all if they're all, oh, we need to add an executive session to this meeting. Yeah, there must be something wrong if you're doing it on this meeting. Ooh, they're talking about me. Yeah. Well, what are they talking about? What do I need to be worried about? And so it's always on there. And I think it also fosters additional open communication for the board members with the board chair and executive committee so that they're taking that time. They're all jumping on that separate Zoom or they're excusing me from the meeting. And then they're proceeding with that. It may last two minutes. It may last 30 minutes. And sometimes it has lasted 15 to 30 minutes, even though they didn't have anything specific to talk about, but stuff came up. And what I hear from folks, and I don't know the details of those conversations, is that it's been really helpful. And so that way it doesn't set me, you know, set off any alarms in my head because, oh, there's an executive session on this board meeting agenda. <laughs> well, and it's been really important. And I say this a lot. I speak on this subject quite a bit. The communication between the board, the head of the board and the head of the organization is so critical that it's fluid and transparent. And I have said to Nate a hundred times, we will never meet without you knowing. We will never have a conversation without you being privy. If you're not involved, when we're done with our executive sessions, I always call or text Nate and say, great executive session. I mean, the reality is, is keeping that communication and trust is so critical to the health. We want Nate to bring everything to us. Why in the world wouldn't we feel the same way? Right. That it's up to us to never let him think, are they having meetings on the side? We will never do that. I mean, and I have had people have offered that within the board and I have said that fine, but either Nate joins us or let's have the discussion and then I'm going to discuss it with Nate because I mean, we're paying him a great salary to run this organization. Why would we sabotage him by not including him in our thinking or in our meetings? So we never, ever do that. It's just to me, the most ill thing you could do for an organization is not really be a proponent of great communication and transparency. And transparency, again, going back to our conversation two weeks ago, key to running a great organization. Right. And I really appreciate your comments on 
being conscientious and conscious of everybody's time in the meeting, Rick. And for me, we, my board, that we tend to get into long conversations and I'm working my eyes around the room and making sure that everybody has a voice. And often people want to double up, right? They want to reiterate their comments. And at that point, you know, I'm calling on people around the room who have not spoken, give it, making sure that everybody has a chance to speak. And once, once everybody does, I want to acknowledge that, okay, everybody's had a chance to speak. Do we have anything else on this that's new that we haven't heard? Then, then let's move on. Let's have the vote or let's move on to the next topic. Right. The chair and the person leading these meetings, it's not just because you've been there for a while. You really need to know how to manage these things. And yeah. I remember my first year as chair, I didn't feel like I did a very good job. And I was very um, transparent with Nate about feeling like we were you know, the meetings were falling off. We did have a board member who said, you know, I don't think I want to be involved anymore because of the meetings. And I was like, you know what? I am not doing my job as leader in this. I am not engaging myself. I'm showing up and conducting a meeting. And that is not enough. Yeah. But that's the only thing I've ever done wrong on the board. Everything else I've done has been fantastic. Right, Nate? I'm sure it has been. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to be conscious of your time. You have been terrific in, in lending us your time, both of you, to be part of this podcast. So if we're going to wrap up here. If listeners could take away one thing from this episode, um, something that we've talked about or even something that hasn't come up, what would that be? Rick? Yeah, real easy, real simple, straight to the point. Do your damn job. Nice. That's the thing I would say. Can I say damn? You can say it. You can say do your damn job. Curtis, don't edit that out. <laughs> Nate. I'm going to say structure and agenda are your friends. And that's that goes contrary to how I generally operate. So um, <laughs> I'm just going to say, allow that to serve you and your board in a way that is supportive. All right. Hey, Nate Roten, Rick McCartney, thank you again for joining us on another episode and uh, really have enjoyed this conversation. This has just been terrific. And um, I think a much needed conversation on running effective board meetings. Where can listeners find out more about you and the work that you do? Rick, again, let's start with you. Um, well, I run In Business Magazine as the publisher in the greater Phoenix area. So they can certainly go to In Business phx.com to get more information on, I think, a lot of the great stuff that our staff is disseminating to the community. We also have a huge nonprofit business side of the magazine. We think nonprofits run just like companies, so it's very critical that they understand business like anybody else. Super. Nate? You can find out more about 1 in 10 on our website at 1in10.org, as well as our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. All right. Rick, Nate, Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Rich. It was great. Thank you, Rich. All right. And thank you to our producer, the inimitable Curtis Schmidt. Russ Faniff, we miss you. Remember, there ain't no mountain high enough. And to you, our listeners, thank you for joining us. We'll see you the next time on the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. That concludes this episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. Thanks to our panel for sharing their insights and expertise. If you'd like to learn more about our panel members or any of the organizations or resources featured in this episode, we will include links in the show notes. If you like this podcast, we would love your help spreading the word. First, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app, so you always know when a new episode is released. Second, forward the episodes you like to friends and colleagues or share them on social media. Word of mouth is one of the best ways you can help us reach more nonprofit professionals like yourself. And if you use Apple Podcasts or Audible, please leave us a review. Positive reviews are how many listeners decide whether or not to try out a new podcast. We appreciate your help. For suggestions on topics, guests, or nonprofit organizations you'd like to hear on the podcast, send an email with the subject heading NPFX suggestion to contact at ipmadvancement.com. For back episodes and more resources like white papers, infographics, and blog articles, please visit the free IPM Advancement Nonprofit Resource Library at ipmadvancement.com forward slash resources. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.